The Tafsir of Surah Tawaha by Shaykh Abdul Nasser Jangda. The following video is from the Quran Intensive, Bayina Summer Program. For more information, go to bayinasummer.com. This video was filmed and produced by Salam Studios and is brought to you by MuslimMatters.org. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وهل أتاك حديث موسى إذ رأى نارا فقال لأهلهم كثوا إني آنست نارا إني آنست نارا لعلي آتيكم منها بقبس لعلي آتيكم منها بقبس أو أجد على النار هدى فلما أتاها نودي يا موسى إني أنا ربك فاخلعن عليك إنك بالوادي المقدس طوى وأنا اخترتك فاستمع لما يوحى إنني أنا الله لا إله إلا أنا فاعبدني وأقم الصلاة لذكري إن الساعة آتية أكاد أخفيها أكاد أخفيها لتجزى كل نفس بما تسعى فلا يصدنك عنها من لا يؤمن بها واتبع هواه فتردى <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين So in yesterday's session we completed the first portion of Surah Taha, the first section of the surah, which is an introduction into the topic of the surah, and which also captures the essence, the core, the thesis of the surah, and that is Islam is a blessing and not a curse, and that very powerful, very touching, you know, emotional consoling of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam done direct done directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in the book of Allah, in the Quran, preserved up till now for 1400 years for all of us to continue to read and benefit from that. Now the consoling of the Prophet ﷺ continues. But it continues along a different line. This is the second major portion of the surah which makes up for the bulk of the surah and this is a very detailed telling of many of the experiences of Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam of course is the most commonly, most frequently mentioned prophet throughout the Quran and his story is told more so than any other messenger or any other prophet. There's many many reasons for this. I'll summarize them very briefly here but the experiences of Musa alayhi salam, in fact all the anbiya that are mentioned in the Quran the wisdom and the insight of mentioning those specific prophets in the Quran is that there is direct connection, there, is, there are similarities, there are parallels that can be drawn between the experiences of the Prophet ﷺ and those messengers and those prophets that are spoken about in the Quran. Musa salam, more so than the other messengers and prophets, there are a lot of parallels that can be drawn. At the same time, Musa salam was along with Ibrahim salam, Musa salam is someone who, a messenger and a prophet who had a lot of credibility with the Ahlul Kitab, the people who were following the other divine religions or the heavenly, the scripture-based religions. And because of that, drawing parallels between the Prophet or the revelation that the Prophet is reciting and delivering to the people, that revelation speaking about Musa salam very frequently establishes a lot of credibility for the Prophet salam and his message in the eyes and in the sights and the hearts and the minds of these people that are receiving and that are listening to and that are hearing of this message and this this um, and are interacting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. At the same time, it's something that's very interesting is Makkan revelation, such as Surah Taha. Makkan revelation talks about Musa alayhi salam more than Medinan revelation does. Because that was very comforting and very consoling for the Prophet sallallahu and the believers. Because when you talk about the experiences of Musa alayhi salam, for the bulk of many of the experiences of Musa alayhi salam involve a lot of difficulty, a lot of adversity. 
at the hands of a great, you know, tyrant, and at the hands of a very oppressive people, and automatically there's a lot of, you know, co consolation, there's a lot of comfort in that for the believers and for the prophets of Allah, said, because again, you don't feel alone anymore. There's a sense of fraternity. There's a sense of brotherhood. There's a sense of connection. Okay, somebody else has been through this. Somebody else has experienced this. Somebody else knows what we're going through. And we're not alone in this. And the fact that we're here downtrodden or we're here oppressed or that we're going through adversity, that's not a curse. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't need to be guilty. We don't need to reassess ourselves. What we're doing is we're following the truth. And what establishes that fact is that there were nations before us. For example, Musa alayhi salam and his followers, that they also went through adversity, they also went through difficulty in the pursuit of this truth. So that's very comforting for someone, for a believer to hear this, and especially for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And generally, the bulk of Surah Taha is made up of stories. And st the purpose of storytelling in the Qur'an does not define the Qur'an. Meaning the Qur'an is not a novel, it's not a story book. But the Qur'an uses stories to teach lessons. And this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly explains here in the Qur'an, in the book of Allah itself. In Surah Hud, Surah number 11, Ayah number 120, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلَّنَّ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ That وَكُلَّنَّ نَقُصُّ That each and every single, all of the stories that we tell, that we are telling to you مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ From all the different stories of all the different messengers and prophets مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ All of them can be defined and described by one thing that they all serve one primary purpose and that they are being sent down, they are being told, they are being revealed to Strengthen your heart. And specifically the word that Allah uses is fu'ad, which talks about the heart when it is struggling, the heart when it is experiencing some very powerful emotions, when the heart is turbulent. And at that point in time, this will solidify your heart. By just giving you that sense of belonging. And by realizing that there's nothing wrong with you. And so this is a little bit of an intro to the story of Musa alayhi salam. Now in ayah number 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself gives us an introduction to the story of Musa alayhi salam where Allah says, وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى That has the story of Musa come to you? Has the story of Musa come to you? Has it reached you? Has it come to you? And the wording is very specific here. He didn't say, do you know about the story of Musa? Because maybe the Prophet ﷺ has some general knowledge or understanding of who Musa ﷺ is. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is establishing the means of that knowledge that the only way you would know about Musa ﷺ is if it came to you. And where else would knowledge come to you but directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So has this come to you yet? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a very specific word when talking about this story of Musa ﷺ coming to him, and Allah uses the word hadith. Hadith, when, which in its roots, it actually means something new or something that occurs, something new, a new occurrence, a new experience. A new experience, that is the word that is used. Now it's an established fact, al-musta'mal عند al-Arab, that it is an established fact that the Arabs use the word hadith to talk about news or information or a story even. So that's fine, but nevertheless, the Qur'anic eloquence demands of us to at least explore the concept and the idea of why Allah uses the word hadith here, and not the word qissa, or not the word naba, or not the word khabar, because in other places Allah does use those words. Min amba'ir rusul, the plural of naba. So why did Allah use this word hadith here? So the scholars explain, number one, nab, hadith yadullu ala kalamin jadidin, that either it can mean some new, like you might know a little bit about Musa alayhi salam, but we're about to tell you something new, something you didn't know before. Along with that, the scholars also explain that the word hadith many times in eloquence, like in poetry, it's also used to explain that maybe you already knew this, but this is something that, you know, has kind of faded away distantly into your memory. It's fallen into the recesses of your mind. That yes, you knew it. You might have loosely, you might even loosely remember it. But it's something that has become very distant from your thoughts. So we're bringing it to your attention. Again, we are renewing something new, right? We are renewing your understanding of this. And lastly and finally, نَظْرُ يَدُلُّ عَلَى نَظْرٍ جَدِيدٍ 
That yes, it's a story, and yes, you already know this story, and it's something you already know, but let us show you something new about it that maybe you didn't realize before. That every single time this story is told, there are new lessons and new realizations. There are new reflections that are occurring and that are being realized every single time this story is read or is being retold. And of course, that fits right in with the Qur'an, the Book of Allah, the miracle of the Qur'an, the miracle of the Book of Allah, that these are stories, these are surahs. How many times maybe have you heard this surah? Have you read the translation of this surah? Maybe you've listened to a tafsir of this surah. But it's almost every single time you revisit a surah, any surah, surah Tul Fatiha for that matter, that there's almost a new lesson to learn every single time. And that's the beauty, that's the magnificence, that's the blessing of the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces us to this. Now secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking this as a question. And this is, the scholars explain that this is a rhetorical question. This is a rhetorical question, meaning, obviously. hadith Musa Has the story of Musa from a new angle reached you? Of course it hasn't. But why is a rhetorical question asked? It's a rhetorical device. All right, It's asked to spark the curiosity of the listener, of the mukhatab, of the one being addressed. Hey, did you hear about that? Well, of course, of course I haven't heard about that. That's why you're here telling me about it. Hey, did you find out? Of course I haven't found out yet. I'm going to find out now from you. But what that does is that peaks, sparks, incites the curiosity of the listener, of the reader. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's called at tashwiq Al-istifham lit tashwiq Alright, so it's a rhetorical question to incite, to excite the listener. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, إِذْ رَآ نَارًا Now he's talking about Musa alayhi salam, and Allah begins with, with إِذْ إِذْ يَعْنِي أُذْكُرْ فِي الْمَاضِي That remember, recall something that's already occurred in the past. إِذْ رَآ نَارًا that, And whenever this word إِذْ is used, it's literally telling you, try to imagine, try to picture. Try to take a walk through this scene. Try to picture, envision what is exactly going on. So it's to create a very real feel and mode to it. That remember back. Imagine you're there kind of watching. A fly on the wall. Musa alayhi salam sees a fire. Musa alayhi salam, he sees a fire. فَقَالَ لِأَهْلِهِ And he says to his family. Now I'm going to pause right here real quick. And the reason why I'm going to pause here is because to explain a little bit of the background information. What's going on? Where are we at in the life and the story of Musa alayhi salam? Surah Al-Qasas and a few other places in the Quran, they tell us a little bit about what happened before. And even Surah Taha will kind of reflect back. Like the Quran is the epitome of even the storytelling, even though that's not the primary purpose, to just entertain it's to teach a lesson, but still it te tells a story better than you can imagine. Like when sometimes you watch a movie or you read a book, and the, the, the way they tell the story in the movie or in the book fascinates you. And afterwards you were like, it was so brilliant, it was so amazing, how they went about in doing that. Well, look at the style of the Qur'an. So the Qur'an will reflect back, almost have flashbacks. So in the story of Musa alayhi salam here in Surah Taha, there will be flashbacks to the past of Musa alayhi salam. But where is it starting from right now? So to really summarize, all right, Musa alayhi salam of course is born into a family of Banu Israel. He's born at a time when Fir'aun, this tyrant ruler, is killing the children, the, the sons of Banu Israel. And at that point in time, Allah, and the mother of Musa is very concerned, and Allah instructs her to place the child, that first take care of him, nurse him, do a mother's job. And when you worry about him, when you fear for his life, put him inside of a... Box, literally. All right? And put that box into the river. And let it carry it. And your and my enemy will basically come to find this child. So Musa alayhi salam is put into the river. He floats. Fir'aun finds him. Fir'aun's wife basically wants to take him in. And at that point in time, he's raised in the house of Fir'aun. Now Musa alayhi salam, being from Banu Israel, sympathizing with his people... But being raised in the house of Fir'aun, so having a little bit of status, he runs into a little bit of a situation as Surah Al-Qasas speaks about, and again, Taha will refer to, all right, and we'll have a flashback to, and we'll talk about it in more detail at that time. But he basically has a confrontation with an individual, and a man dies. 
At that point in time, Musa alayhi salam has to flee. He runs from there. He's told, you need to get out of here. They're going to try to kill you. And Musa alayhi salam runs from there. He goes to a place called Madian. There Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divinely arranges. He has nothing. He has nowhere to stay, nowhere to go, nothing to eat. He doesn't know what to do with himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the arrangements. He gets a job. He gets married. Everything's taken care of. And he even gets a mentor. And he stays there for what the Mufassirun say that the Quranic language alludes to the fact that he stays there for about 10 years, a decade. After staying there for about a decade, now he's leaving, now he's traveling, now he wants to kind of go and resettle himself and kind of, you know, figure out what he's exactly going to do with his life. And so he's got his family with him and he's traveling. Now that he's traveling with his family, they're stopping somewhere and based on the language of the ayat, and there are other ayat that corroborate this ayah, that, that, that complement this ayah, we basically come to realize that it's nighttime and it's possibly even cold. And so when you're camping out while you're traveling and you need to stop somewhere because it's dark and it's cold, you basically need heat and you need light. Right? For us, that means a hotel. At the, at the time of Musa alayhi salam, that meant a fire. That meant a fire. All right, so he needs to find a fire. So ra'ana, so he kind of, they're moving along and he's cautiously kind of looking around. He's driving down the freeway, looking for a, stop, for a sign somewhere, a billboard somewhere, a flashing sign somewhere that says vacancy. He's looking for something. And then all of a sudden he sees it in the distance. Ra'ana ran. So he stops. How you immediately slam on the brakes, you start to slow down. And you turn on your indicator, you're ready to pull over. And immediately, you know, your wife looks over to you and says, what are you doing, what are you doing? Why are you pulling over over here? And so immediately he says, فَقَالَ لِأَهْلِهِ أُمْكُثُوا He says, all right, y'all stay here. Y'all stay here. Just like when you pull up in front of the hotel, what do you tell your family? All right, y'all sit tight, lock the doors, let me go check inside. Let me go ask if they have any rooms available. Let me go ask them what their rates are. And then you go inside and you check. It's very real. So Musa alayhi salam tells his family, Umkuthu, because I know this place, I've kind of scoped this out. I'm comfortable here. All right, so you sit tight right here. Because I'm not sure. فَقَالَ li umkuthu. So y'all stay here. Inni anastu naran. I saw something. The language that he uses is anasa. Anastu naran. Inas. Inas in the Arabic language, has, it's a very interesting word. It's a very interesting word. One thing the Mufassirun, based on the classical language, they say that it is to notice, to feel, to, to, to feel, to notice something. La shubha tafihi. That there's no doubt, I did see something. Like my eyes aren't playing tricks on me. Like I'm convinced I saw something. But at the same time, it's not to actually physically see always. It's almost to kind of know. I feel, I think, I'm pretty certain that I saw something. And so what do we understand and realize from this? So he says, Inni ana sunaran. I have no doubt that I feel, I'm fairly convinced that there's a fire here. I feel that there's a fire. I'm convinced that there's a fire. But he's not saying, I see a fire. He saw a fire, but now when he's talking to his family, he's like, I'm pretty sure, I'm certain that there's a fire over there. The reason why he's using this language, because some of the Mufassirun explain, because he saw the fire, but now the fire was invisible. Either it was a flash, like he did see a fire, but it wasn't visible anymore. Or the fact that maybe he sees the fire, but nobody else can see it. Like, look, 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 you see, you see it? Like, I don't see what you're talking about. Like, trust me, it's over there. I know this, all right? Just let me do my thing. All right? I know that it's over there. And so what that tells you is two things. Number one, that tells you that it wasn't just the fact that he saw it with his eyes, but he felt it with his heart. Because this wasn't just a fire that he saw. This was Allah calling him. This was Allah calling him, come here. So it's not just something that he saw with his eyes. Yes, there was a manifestation, a visual manifestation of that calling from Allah to get his attention because at this point in time, Musa alayhi salam, yes, he's Salimul Fitra, yes, he's a Nabi and a Rasul, and Allah protects his Nabis, his Anbiya and his Rusul. 
So he's Salim al Fitra, but at the same time, he hasn't received divine revelation yet. So it's much like the Prophet ﷺ, when we read the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, and this is where we start to make the connection between Musa ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ, that before Iqra Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq happened, he was seeing dreams that would come to fruition, realization. They would be realized. He was going to the cave and would spend days on end by himself just in reflection that I know there's something. I know there's something. So there's deep down realization, but at the same time, it's not obvious, it's not apparent completely yet. Because this person isn't ready yet. This person isn't ready yet. It's a step-by-step -step process. And I met, in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, it even mentions, narrations mentions that these true dreams that they would have, this is a sunnah of Allah, that anyone who has meant all the Prophets and the Anbiya, all the Prophets and the Messengers, before even the Prophet ﷺ, this was something that would occur with all of them. To generally prepare them. So Musa ﷺ saw something. And it was, and not only did he see it, but he also felt it because it's calling him, Allah is calling him. And that the second thing that this tells you is that this was meant only for Musa alayhi salam. This was an invitation from Allah only to Musa alayhi salam, so nobody else could see it. So he says, Inni anastu naran. I'm certain, I know that there's a fire out there. Just trust me here. Inni anastu naran. And that's why he says it with emphasis. Inni anastu. Most definitely, I sense. I'm sure that I sense. A fire. Inni anastu naran. Then he goes on to say, لَعَلِّي آتِيكُمْ مِنْهَا لَعَلِّي آتِيكُمْ مِنْهَا بِقَبَسٍ لَعَلِّي لَعَلَّ in the Arabic language, لِلْرَجَى لِلْتَرَجِّي لِلْتَرَجِّي Alright, it means that I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Very hopeful in regards to what? And you see that hope manifesting. Again, this is the preparation of the heart and the spiritual condition of Musa alayhi salam. I'm very hopeful that I will come to you from it, from that fire, bi qabasin. Al qabsu in the Arabic language, al iqtibas, it means to take something. It's a general word for taking something. And qabas in the Arabic language, specifically referring to fire, means to bring back some fire, to take a little bit of fire, to bring back some fire. Now in the Qur'an, in different places when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells this story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a couple of more specific. This is the most general wording and phrasing that is used in the Qur'an, here in Surah Taha. In a couple of other places, such as Surah Al-Qasas and Surah Al-Naml, in Surah Al-Qasas and in Surah Al-Naml, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses more specific language. He uses more specific language. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in one place in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Naml, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بِشِهَابٍ قَبَسٍ أَوْ آتِيكُمْ بِشِهَابٍ قَبَسٍ Shihab in the Arabic language literally means a fire that is blazing. A fire that is actually blazing, like actual flames. So not only will I come back from there with fire, or, or bring back a piece of that fire, but I'll actually like light a torch and bring it back from there. I'll light a torch and bring it back from there. In another place in the Quran, in Surah Al-Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word, أَوْ جَذْوَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ Oh, jadwa min anar. Jadwa in the Arabic language specifically means to bring back maybe like a burning coal or an amber from the fire. Something that is red and lit up, like bringing back an actual burning amber or coal from the fire. And so these are a couple of more specific wordings that are used in the Quran. But Surah Taha is the most, most general, you know, version. Where it just says, بِقَبَسٍ I'm just going to bring something back from there. I'm going to grab something from that fire and bring it to you. Now, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use... So when, when a general address is used, that's a general address. And that probably is the, the reason why the most general wording is used in Surah Taha. Is because Surah Taha is the more detailed, long version telling of the story of Musa alayhi salam. Why did all, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Naml talk about an actual flame from the fire being brought back? Because the tone of Surah An-Naml, 
The tone of Surah An-Namal is very strong, it's very powerful. It's a reflection of the tone of the surah. When you read Surah An-Namal, what you actually find and you actually see is Surah An-Namal is very heavy in its tone. It's very heavy in its tone, overall. Surah Al-Qasas uses a lighter word, Jadwatim min al-Nar. Jadwa already means like some little piece of the fire. And min in the Arabic language further means littab'iz, a small piece. So jadwatim min al-Nar means a very, very small little piece of the fire. Because Surah Al-Qasas is very humble in its tone. It's very humble in its tone. So it reflects here in the language. Anyways, getting back on, getting back on track in terms of what we were talking about. So Musa alayhi salam says that he saw a fire. Remember back when he saw a fire. And he turns to his family and he says, All right, y'all stay here. Y'all sit tight. Inni anastu naran. I'm certain that there's a fire. Just trust me, I'm certain that there's a fire out there. La'alli atikum minna biqabasin. And I'm very hopeful that I will come back to you from there with a piece of that fire. Something from what I've seen. Alright? Or he says, Oh... And at the very, and maybe even possibly, so at the very least, he says, I'll bring a fire back from there. And now as he kind of indulges in this conversation, the more he thinks about it, the more he reflects on what he saw, now he becomes more and more hopeful. And you see that iman, the heart being more and more prepared, the spirituality, the hope, the iman in the heart continuing to grow, the more he reflects on what he has saw. And he says, Oh, ajidu ala nari hudan. Or I will find upon that fire. And this is, um, this is a figure of speech in Arabic. Alright, it's, it's, it's a figure of speech, it's a phrase in Arabic. Alannar. Alright, and, and in classical Arabic they would even say, Nimtu alannar. Nimtu alannar. I slept on the fire. Now it doesn't literally mean that he slept on a fire. It's not David Blaine. All right? It doesn't literally mean he slept on a fire. That's not what it's talking about. But when in classic Arabic, when they say, I slept on a fire, it's mean, what it means is, I slept near a fire. I slept near the fire. That's what it means. So when he says, Oh, ajidu ala nar, that I will find upon the fire, means I will find near that fire that I saw, hudan, guidance. I will find guidance near that fire. And of course, literally speaking, what he meant by guidance in that particular context was, I'll find somebody to give me directions. I'll find somebody to give me, if there's a fire there, there's got to be people there, and they'll be able to tell us a good place to stay, a better route, etc., etc. I'll find somebody that I can talk to and I can figure out this area. But again, the words of the Qur'an and the words of Musa alayhi salam through the Qur'an are very, very interesting. Because it's very general language that alludes to, that points towards something, that very subtly is sending a message. I will bring something back from that fire. And it was Allah that who was inviting him there, it was Allah who was calling him there, and Allah sent down his speech and his kalam to him there, and he brought that back. I will bring back something from that fire, a little bit of piece of that fire, a little bit of the wisdom and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Divine revelation. And oh, ajidu ala nari huda, or I will find some guidance upon that fire. And of course, he was going to find the ultimate guidance near where he saw that fire. Now, one thing that needs to be mentioned here is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. When Musa Ali Salam, and, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of ourselves here, because I'd like to go ahead and kind of get this out of the way real quick, here at ayah number 10. When Musa Ali Salam actually went there, was there a fire there or not? Again, was that just something to call the attention of Musa Ali Salam? Because he was a traveler, and again, it, it couldn't just simply be like, hey, come get divine revelation. Be like, whoa, wait a second, what are you talking about? Right? Even the Prophet ﷺ, naturally his heart became heavy with what was going on with his people. He was having these dreams and he needed, wanted to reflect and contemplate and think. And so he kind of walked outside of Mecca, you know, a few miles outside of Mecca. And they just started walking up a mountain. They found a very small secluded little recess inside of the mountain, a small little cave, the cave of Hira, which is literally described as almost being like a small little recess more than what we think of a cave. 
all right, like the Bat Cave, right? Our images of a cave, it wasn't something like that, all right? He didn't drive like the Batmobile into it, all right? It was literally a small little recess, a small little hole for him to just kind of seclude himself in. And it was very beautiful because he could see the Kaaba from the opening of that cave. All right, so, and there was a small little hole on the end of the cave, and because of that, wind would blow through there, and it was very cool and comforting inside of that cave. So he found the perfect little spot for him to sit down and think and reflect. So he was almost kind of called there, brought there, through the overall, his situation and his circumstances. And once he got there and he got kind of comfortable there, then Jibreel alayhi salam came down, and then, of course, divine revelation came, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Similarly, Musa alayhi salam is a traveler and he's looking out for his family and he needs to make arrangements for his family. So now was the fire just simply shown to him to kind of draw him in, to bring him in to something that he was already looking for so that he'd be comfortable in approaching. Or, and once he got there, was there actually a fire there or not? Wallahu ta'ala a'lamu bis sawab. Allah knows best. The Quran really doesn't elaborate a lot in regards to that. It does have a few words in a couple other places that does kind of allude to that and talk about that. And then there is a hadith in Musnad Ahmad. There is a hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad that when Musa alayhi salam went there, there was a flame. And that lot tree that is often talked about. There was a flame from a small tree. And there was a flame rising from that tree. But it wasn't like any other flame. And some of the more extended generations talk about Musa salam even going near that flame and trying to interact with that flame. Trying to see if it was a normal fire or not because it looked different. And some of the generations talk about that it was a green colored flame. So very possibly there could have been a fire there. Now, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, aside from Musa alayhi salam circumstances, why was a, the symbol of a fire a very appropriate means and symbolic of a calling Musa alayhi salam to divine revelation? And if we take these narrations, such as the one mentioned in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, then again, why would that fire be there? Well, because this is something that is alluded to in even a hadith of Sahih Muslim, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, Radiallahu anhu narrates from the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anillahi azza wa jal that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa speaks about Allah and he says hijabuhu an-nar hijabuhu an-nar that the barrier and the curtain separating the creation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a hijab of nur but it's like a fire it's bright and it's blazing nur hijabuhu an-nar law kashaf law لَوْ كَشَفَهَا That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to open this curtain, لَحْتَرَقَتْ سُبْحَاتُ وَجْهِ مَنْ تَهَا إِلَيْهِ بَصَرُهُ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ That literally the nur emanating from the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be so powerful, would be so overwhelming to the creation of Allah that as far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's vision sees into His creation, which is everything, it would literally incinerate everything. It would literally burn everything to nothingness. It would burn everything to ashes. So that hijab that protects us from this very overwhelming nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in this dunya we cannot tolerate, we are not ready for. But one of the gifts in akhirah, one of the gifts to Ahlul Jannah is that they will be able to look at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what protects us in this dunya is that curtain of fire. So it's very symbolic and related. And also nur and nar, they both come from the same root as well. There are similarities between the two. So while we perceive many times nar to be something very negative, because the punishment is fire, but at the same time we also have to understand that nar in and of itself is very resemblant, uh, resemblant and symbolic of nur, and that is that illuminating force and light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I wanted to touch on this. Now, ayah number 11 tells us, Falamma ataha. Falamma ataha. So then, when Musa alayhi salam came to it, and that it refers to that fire that he had seen. And that right there is one of the places where the language is also letting you know, it's alluding to the fact that there was an actual fire that he came to. And again, we'll leave the specifics of the fire alone. Wallahu ta'ala a'lamu bis sawab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So when he came to it, when he arrived at the fire, Nu diya ya Musa. Nu diya ya Musa. He was called out to. 
The language of the Quran here is very specific. This conversation of Allah with Musa alayhi salam, it details and explains to us the entire journey of Iman. The entire journey of developing faith and Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Belief. Formalizing and formulating and solidifying within the heart of a, of a human being. So the first word is nudiya. Nudiya is majhul. Which means that it's a passive verb. He was called out to. Why called out to? Why didn't say Allah called out to him? He was called out to. Musa was called out to. Because at this point in time, yes, Musa alayhi salam, I go back to saying, because we don't disrespect, we have the utmost respect and honor and dignity for the prophets and the anbiya even before revelation. But right now, he doesn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not on a personal level, he doesn't intimately know Allah. So right now, Nudia, he just hears somebody calling out to him. He doesn't know who it is. So at this point in time, it's Nudia. He was just being called out to. He was just hearing a voice. Later on, in another place in the Quran, Allah tells us that once that iman is realized, then what? وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Then Allah spoke to Musa, very clearly spoke to him, repeatedly spoke to him. <clears throat> But right now it's Nudia. He was called out to. He heard a voice. And what did the voice say? Ya Musa. O oh Musa. Now factor that in. Number one, there's a certain etiquette that is being taught here as well. Addressing someone with their name. Addressing someone with their name. Secondly, I want you to just imagine the shock. It's shocking enough that you're hearing a voice. Secondly, the voice knows your name. I want you to realize that shock. And that initial shock is consistent throughout all the first revelations of all the prophets. Rasulullah was squeezed by Jibreel salam, was pressed hard by him. So that traumatic experience is consistent throughout all the first revelations upon all the prophets. So not only does he hear a voice, but the voice knows his name. But you know subtly what we realize about this? Nudia is Musa Alayhi perspective. He just hears a voice. He doesn't know Allah. But Allah is letting him know, but I know you. Ya Musa. You might not know who I am, but I know exactly who you are. Ya Musa. Oh Musa. And when somebody calls on you by your name like that, it almost shows anticipation. Awaiting someone. That oh Musa, meaning we've been waiting for you. This has been a long time coming. We've been waiting for you. We're, we're prepared for you. Ya Musa. In ayah number 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now to calm Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to introduce himself to Musa alayhi salam. He says, inni, most definitely I. Ana, I. Inni ana. He uses emphasis and then the e, the extra ya on the word inna here. The extra ya is the attached pronoun for the first person singular. Most definitely I. And then Allah uses the independent pronoun for the first person singular, ana. Inni ana. Most definitely I and only I. Meaning this is me. And I and only I am Rabbuka. So Allah begins to introduce himself to Musa alayhi salam. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where you would expect this to go, it doesn't exactly go. It's going to go there later. The direction Allah takes it in, He emphasizes to him that, listen, this is me. I'm the one talking to you. And I and only I am Rabbuka. I am your Lord, your master. Rabb. The one who created you, the one who feeds you, the one who sustains you, the one who protects you. The one who protected you when you were a baby. The one who put the directions and the instructions into the heart of your mother. The one who raised you in the house of your eventual enemy. The one who sent someone to you to inform you that you were going to be killed, you were going to be prosecuted. The one that when you were sitting under the shade of the tree and you didn't know where to go and what to do with yourself, the one who sent everything to you on a silver platter. A job, a wife, a family, a mentor gave you everything. 
and the one who has called you here now, and the one that is about to give you something that you never could have seen coming. The one that is about to make you someone that for generations, for thousands of years, for millennia, people will look up to you, people will talk about you, people will read about you. And the one that is about to bestow upon you the greatest blessing that is ever bestowed upon any human being. In the book. I'm the one who took care of you up until now, and I'll be the one that will take care of you from here on out. That's the introduction to Allah. That's how Iman develops. We saw that already in the beginning of Surah Taha as well, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about Himself, before saying, Allahu, La ilaha illa huwa, Lahu al-asma'ul husna, before He said that, He said, Mimman khalaq al-arda wa samawat al-ula. He first said, He is the one who created the ground that you walk on and the skies most high that you look up at. The introduction to Allah, Iman 101, is to realize all the blessings of Allah in our life and the greatness of Allah that surrounds us and to look at it, to marvel at it, and to learn from it. And we can learn a lot about this. We can learn a lot from this about education of Iman, about da'wah and about teaching Iman. Whether it to be in the Muslim community and if anybody doubts that, we should never take this for granted. There is a serious need for education of Iman within the Muslim community. And I'm not saying that because the Muslim community is so terrible now that we have to teach Iman. No, this is something Allah commanded us to do regardless of the state of the Muslim community. It could have been Khairul Qurun. It might have been the generation of the Sahaba, the best of times, but even then, Iman had to be continued to be taught. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, aminu. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, aminu. O you who believe, believe. The Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah bin Rawaha, it's mentioned in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, that Abdullah bin Rawaha radiallahu anhu was a great Sahabi of the Prophet and a man of great faith and great Iman fought on the day of Ghazwa Muta and led the people and eventually lost his life in the battle of the, uh, the battle of Muta. That he used to come to the masjid of the Prophet he would approach the Sahaba wherever he could find them, other companions, other Sahaba, and he would say, Ijlis bina nu'minu sa'atan. Ijlis bina nu'minu sa'atan. Sit with us, let's renew our faith and our iman. Let's learn iman. The Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in an authentic narration, Jaddidu imanakum. Jaddidu imanakum. Refresh and renew your faith. Wa kayfa nujaddidu imanana ya Rasulullah. How should we renew our faith and our iman, O, o, o Messenger of Allah? And he said, بِقَوْلِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَكْثِرُوا مِنْ قَوْلِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ Say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ frequently. Reflect on the meaning of لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ Think about what that tells you, what that means. So, when we talk about the education of Iman, which is desperately needed in the Muslim community, which is our obligation to the non-Muslim community, and even when we talk about our children, that the way to teach Iman the way to teach Iman is through this natural means that Allah taught Iman through to even the Prophets and the Anbiya alayhim salam. The way Allah taught us Iman in the Qur'an. And that's by look in your life, appreciate the blessings of Allah, look at the world around you, marvel at the creation of Allah and ask one simple question, who created this? Who created this? And this is very, very important. This is how the Qur'an and how the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa taught us to teach Iman. And it needs to be done. And it's very practical. It is the most natural, practical, intuitive way to teach Iman. I took my children, my daughters, I took them to the zoo. And afterwards, when we were leaving, you know, all day long they had seen all these exotic animals, seen everything. One simple question. So I asked them, all right, what did you see here today? So then it's like, I saw a peacock, and I saw a bear, and I saw a lion, and a tiger, and a bear, right? So they're like freaking out, right? Like it's unbelievable. I saw two polar bears, and they're just freaking out. So I saw this, and this, and this, and this, and then at the end of it, just one simple question. Who made all of this? Who created all of this? Allah. That's it, Iman. That's how you teach Iman. Last week, or... 
Oh, two weeks ago, I was, last week in fact, I was in Southern California. So I took my kids to the ocean, to the beach. And they ran around and they played and they did their thing. And just sitting there, when they're just kind of sitting there chilling at the beach after just taking a breather, I just kind of pointed at the ocean. I said, that's the ocean. This is the beach. Look at the sand. And then I asked him, who made all of this? Who created all of this? And he said, Allah. And that's Iman. That's how we need to learn to teach Iman. That's how Iman is learned. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching Iman to Musa alayhi salam. Even though it's an expedited process. It's an expedited process. It's the VIP process. It's the AP class, advanced learning. In spite of that, still, this is not bypassed. Inni an rabbuk. I most definitely and only I am your Lord and your master. The one that created you, took care of you, and will continue to take care of you and look out for you. So that introduction is made. So it's first to realize that, look, you haven't lost your mind. Some demons or shaitan or something crazy like that isn't what's talking to you. This is me, your Lord, who is speaking to you. Now that that basic understood, understanding is there, now before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches him anything, before actual knowledge of prophethood and of nubuwa is actually imparted, the first thing Allah tells him to do, ayah number 12, the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to do is, فَخْلَعْنَ alayk. And Allah mentions the word Rabb, now Musa alayhi salam is comfortable, now he's ready to learn. See, the other thing I should mention here, let's talk about the process of teaching. The first thing, the credibility is established. That I'm about to talk to you, but I'm not just nobody, I'm your Lord. So if you're sitting here and you exist and you've benefited and have so many blessings in your life, well, I'm the one that gave them to you, so that credibility is established. Now that credibility is there, now that trust is there, Musa alayhi salam is ready to learn. Before Allah teaches him, he says, فَخْلَعْنَا alayk. فَخْلَعْنَا alayk. Which khala'a in the Arabic language literally means to remove. It means to remove. So he says, remove, take off na'alayk, your shoes. Take off your shoes. Alright? Take a step back. He's receiving prophethood, divine revelation, being given a mission. This, at the surface, superficially, if you look at it very with a simple-minded approach, that doesn't fit into the context here anywhere. All right, because in the next ayah, ayah number 13, go ahead and take a look there, I chose you. So listen very carefully to what's about to be revealed. And then the ayah after that, Allah introduces Himself to him. So where did taking off your shoes, what does that have to do with anything? Superficially it doesn't, but when you sit down and you apply yourself and you think about it, it's actually very important. فَخْلَعْنَا alayk, Take off your shoes. The purpose and the reason for this is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, before you can learn, you got to be ready to learn. Adab before ilm. Adab before ilm. The Sahaba, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, one of the most learned of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, he says, تَعَلَّمْنَا الْإِيمَانِ ثُمَّ تَعَلَّمْنَا الْقُرْآنِ فَزَّدْنَا إِيمَانًا بِهِ We learned iman. Then we learned the Qur'an. Then when we learned the Qur'an, our iman increased, kept on increasing as we continue to learn the Qur'an. I've talked about this many times in specific circles of the students. That we right now, overall as an ummah, are kind of going through this beginning stages of a revival. To not get too ahead of ourselves, beginning stages of a revival if you will. That we realize there's so much for us to learn about the Qur'an, about the life of the Prophet about our deen. And now knowledge is being sought, knowledge is being demanded, knowledge is wanted. And so people want knowledge, they want ilm, they are seeking out knowledge, seeking out ilm. Forums, programs, situations are being created where this knowledge can be learned and imparted. That's a beautiful thing. But in this phase that we're in, we can't lose sight of one thing. The test, the imtihan, the test and the trial, the fitna of this phase and this mode will be to remember to first learn the adab that will actually make that end beneficial to us. Because remember, the Prophet of Allah didn't ask for information. He didn't even just ask for knowledge. But the Prophet of Allah asked for al-ilm al-nafi'ah. 
Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an. Oh Allah, grant me beneficial knowledge. I ask you for beneficial knowledge. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa'u. Oh Allah, I ask, oh Allah, I take protection in you from knowledge that will not benefit. Because there's no point of it. So the adab before the ilm, it's very, very important. We're very hesitant today because we're in, a, we're in a very, you know, interesting paradox. Where there is this revival and this awakening and this concern and this want for ilm and knowledge. But we ourselves many times, I feel comfortable saying that about us, at least here in the United States. And I don't say that as an outsider talking down to the culture of people in the United States. I was born and raised 30 miles from here. But we as a cult, we are a product of a culture and a society that very frankly lacks a lot of adab. And being put in a position of being taught and learning adab, it damages and it hurts our ego. So when we're told to walk straight, it's like you walk straight. So when you go to somebody and says, I want to learn the tafsir of this. So he says, first you have to learn how to sit. Then you have to learn how to talk. Then you have to learn how to walk. And you got to learn how to ask a question. And it's kind of like, all right, listen, bro. Are you going to teach me or not? Because I could Google this. All right? I can Google this. I really don't got time for this nonsense. All right? You're more than welcome to go back to your cave, to your tree in the middle of the desert. All right? So you're more than welcome to go back to your cave, to your tree in the middle of the desert. And you can go do your old school, traditional, middle of the desert, Bedouin learning thing over there. All right, You can do your whole Jedi situation over there. All right, I ain't interested. All right, I just want the information. I just want the knowledge. That's all I need. But we have to realize and we have to remember that the adab comes before the end. That Allah, when He speaks to one of His messengers, and He gives him divine revelation, and He gives him prophethood and wahi and nubuwa, and He needs to set him out on a mission to confront one of the greatest tyrants that has ever walked this earth, one of the most disobedient of human beings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the history of mankind, to go and free a people, tens and thousands of them that are living a life of oppression. To establish the deen of Allah on the face of the earth. Like we don't got time to waste over here. Give him the knowledge, give him his mission and his job and set him out. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in this situation says, uh-uh, فَخْلَانَ alayk. You take off your shoes. You're going to learn how to learn. You're going to learn how to learn. Learn how to be a student. Otherwise you won't know what to do with this ilm when it comes to you. You won't know what to do with this ilm when it comes to you. That you'll take, an, it, it's, it's like somebody taking a very, buying a, a $400 like electronic device, a smartphone, and uses it for a doorstop. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Before you actually took it, you'd first find that person and slap him. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Right? But that's what happens with the ilm when the adab isn't there. Take off your shoes. And that's why adab is very important. Again, I take this back to that superficial, overzealous student of knowledge mentality. That a lot of times when adab, like I said, when adab is even demanded, then even there's this self-righteous attitude to confront this demand of adab and etiquette. What's your evidence for this? What's the evidence? Like easy there. What's the... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa alayhi salam, take off your shoes. When Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the famous hadith of Jibreel that we learn our iman from, he sat down in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the way we sit, in the style that we sit in tashahud. And he sat close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he put his hands on his thighs. He didn't scratch his hair. He didn't check his, you know, text messages like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. No. He sat down the way we sit in the show. He didn't lay down like this, like, yo, bro, what's up? 
right? He sat down the way that we sit in Tashahud and he put his hands on his thighs and he sat close to the Prophet ﷺ and he sat attentively and looked the, the Prophet ﷺ in the eye and he asked him the question and he would respond to every single question when the Prophet ﷺ gave him a response. And at the end of that hadith, at the end of the narration, the Prophet ﷺ spoke the beautiful poetic words, the prof excuse me, the beautiful prophetic words where the Prophet ﷺ said, Ata Jibril, Atakum yu'allimukum deenakum. This is Jibreel. He came to you to teach you your deen. And that wasn't just the, the conversation that took place between us, but this entire exchange, this entire situation was teaching you about your deen. That's how you learn your deen. So that etiquette, that adab is extremely important. Take off your shoes. And there's a whole... Um, you know, and, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, why take off your shoes? إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى Because you are, most definitely you are, بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ You are in a very sacred valley. The word al-muqaddas comes from quds. Quds means for something to be sacred, for something to be um, very pure and sacred. al muqaddas that which has been sanctified, that which has been purified. Because al qudus the only one who is truly sacred and who can sanctify and declare anything sacred is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anything else that has a sacred status, such as the Baytullah, the Kaaba, even the, uh, the city of Medina or the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid Al-Aqsa, and for that matter, any house, any bait of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, any house of Allah, any masjid, because the Prophet Sallallahu told us, Al-Buyutu, excuse me, Al-Masajidu Buyutu Allahi Ala Al-Ard, that the masajid are the houses of Allah on the face of this earth. Anything else that has been declared sacred or sanctified is by the decree and by the command of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and only He can bestow that sacredness upon anything. So Al-Buad Al-Muqaddas, that this valley has been made sacred, Tuwa, and the name of the valley is Tuwa, which was at the foot of the mountain of Tur. At the foot of the mountain of Tur, some say, or, or and the Mufassim also mentioned that it was overall in the area, the region of Sena. That this was a valley called Tuwa, and this has been made sacred, Musa alayhi salam is being told. So we learn further etiquette from that, that any place that has any sanctity, that it requires our adab and our respect. And as a side note, I do not want to, you know, branch off into this direction, but as a side note, that the issue of masajid itself, that when we talk about the fiqh of salah, the fiqh of salah, when we talk about the fiqh of salah, is it permissible to pray with your shoes on? It is permissible, there's an allowance, there's a permissibility of that, and the Prophet Sallallahu did so in his lifetime. But when you look at the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't wear the shoes inside the masjid. He didn't wear the shoes inside the masjid. 99% of the time in his life, 99.9% .9 of the salawat that he offered in his life, he didn't pray with his shoes on. He prayed with his shoes on once or twice, depending on the difference of narration. And that was to simply explain that if you are outdoors and you are in a situation, and even in one of those situations, when the Prophet ﷺ prayed, Jibreel ﷺ actually came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, take off your shoes, because there's something impure on your shoes. So when you know that your shoes are clean for a fact, and you are outdoors, and the situation is requiring it, then at that point in time, sure, there's some permissibility of praying with your shoes on, but it comes back to the issue of Adab. That in taking off the shoes, there is humility. There's humbling of oneself. And it shows that etiquette, that adab, and that respect. Do you crawl on top of your bed with your shoes on? Don't answer that question. <laughs> All right? Don't answer that question. Hopefully, let me rephrase. Hopefully you don't crawl onto your bed with your shoes on. All right? Because it's just cleanliness. It's a, especially forget about what you do on your own bed. I don't want to know. But if you were at somebody else's home and you were on somebody else's couch or you were on somebody else's bed, you wouldn't crawl up there with your shoes on. You wouldn't do that out of a minimal respect for that person. You stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take off your shoes and humble yourself. And that's why it's part of the adab and even the fiqh of the salah. And it's part of the fiqh and the adab of the masjid. إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ tuwa. You are in the very sacred valley of tuwa. We're going to go ahead and stop here. 
I want to go further. The intention was to go to I number 16, at the very least I number 13, but we should stop. Why? Because it's almost time for the salah, so that we can call the adhan on time and we can pray on time, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.